And let's just bow our heads for a moment and pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my salvation. Amen. <clears throat> There's an old Beatles song written by Paul McCartney that says, Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Earlier this week, somebody that I know posted on Facebook a video clip where Paul McCartney and James Corden took a tour through Liverpool and revisit, they revisited all the old familiar places where Paul McCartney used to perform in pubs and all those places. And they were reminiscing about the good old days. It's a very interesting video clip. And then my friend wrote as a comment on Facebook, he says, it, br it brought tears to my eyes. And then I was quite surprised. Another friend of mine, also about the same age as this one, also wrote the same thing. As I watched it, it brought tears to my eyes. And then I realized, well, we are all sort of in the same age bracket. You see, the Beatles bracket. The time of the Beatles with all those old beautiful old songs. And when you listen to that again, well, it just makes your heart feel very warm. Of course, Paul McCartney wrote this wonderful song about a broken relationship. Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. Now it looks as though they here to stay. Oh, how I long for yesterday, he says. Yesterday. We all have our yesterdays. And sometimes we long for yesterday and we talk about the good old days. Joseph had his yesterday. Joseph, we were talking about Joseph in the morning services and we were following Joseph from Genesis 37 where he was only 17 years old. So we followed him as the blue-eyed boy of his father, the one who got the beautiful coat, the one who had dreams, the wide-eyed boy, 17 years old. And then we followed him where he was thrown in a pit and a very interesting life. His life is the kind of life that novels are written about. It's a kind of life that you see that justifies a Hollywood movie or a musical. It's an interesting life, maybe more interesting than most of us. More things happened in a very short period of time in his life than what happens in most of our lives in a whole lifetime. But in Genesis 41, we see him on the mountaintop of his life. He's there in the court of Pharaoh. He's at 30 years of age. He is the second most powerful person in Egypt. And once again, we can just say it only happens in the movies. But for him, it was a reality. Interesting here in Genesis 41 is the description of the birth of his two sons. And interesting also, the names of those two sons and the order of those names. You see, in the Bible, name giving was not like name giving in the modern time. I don't know about you, but in my country, when it's time for the birth of a baby, they go to Amazon and they go through a whole list of names and they choose and say, this one sounds the best. 
But in those days, it was not like that. The name of a child was a prophecy that was laid on that child. It was a blessing. It was something that follows this child his whole life through. It was a very serious thing. And so Joseph named his two sons very interesting names. The first son he named Manasseh. The second one, Ephraim. Manasseh means to forget. In the Hebrew, it's very interesting. It means keep on forgetting. And then Ephraim means new future. It means fruitfulness, new life. It's very meaningful, those two names. And I want us to just ponder about it this afternoon. The first one is that we would like to look at the yesterdays in Joseph's life. You see, when he writes this, or when this is written, the writer of Genesis wants us to, uh, to know that he, he named these two boys with a certain purpose. He says, God made me, so he named Manasseh, he says, God made me forget all my hardships and my parental home. God made me forget. God deals with his yesterdays, and Joseph deals with his yesterdays. In Joseph's yesterday, there was a dream coat. There was this amazing technical, technicolor dream coat. It was not just a normal present. It was something absolutely out of this world, special. When Joseph was in his dark years, when he was in the pit, when he was rejected, when he was there alone, I think he, he constantly remembered of the days in his father's house. He remembered those wonderful days, those good old days, the days of his dream coat. Just something about the dream coat. In Hebrew, the word announces a royal garment. It was a gift to someone that has special favor in someone's eyes. And in his, in his uh, account, it was his father. Can you imagine the jealousy of all his brothers? I mean, here was this blue-eyed boy. Here was this boy that was uh, his father's favorite son. And now he gave him as a gift this royal robe. It was so special. But this was part of his yesterday and how he remembers yesterday. Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. Remembering yesterday, we all have our dream coat of yesterday, don't we? If I think of going home and I gather with my family, we tell stories of yesterday. We reminisce about those good old days. And in this one photo, it might be on the screen, I see my son and my daughter thinking about yesterday and tell stories about yesterday, the good old days. It makes your heart feel warm. You think of those royal gowns of yesterday, those royal gown moments, great times, yesterday. The problem is not remembering yesterday. That's why we have times of remembrance, times of celebration of yesterday, and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem comes in when we get stuck in yesterday. When we cannot get over our royal gowns of yesterday, the wonderful memories of yesterday. Yes, even the good old days of yesterday those might be the days that we get stuck in. The problem is this. For some people, yesterday is so alive 
that it kills today. I want you to take that in. Yesterday, for many people, are so alive, they cannot move on to today. It kills today. It kills tomorrow. Being stuck in that nostalgia of yesterday, today's sunshine is blacked out. It's like a dark cloud, like a gray, color, gray coloring everything in its way. With today blackened out, tomorrow is met with fear, trembling, and deep suspicion. You get people that they cannot adapt in a new, circumst new circumstances because of yesterday. It's not the same. They, they make all these comparisons of yesterday. It's just not good enough. And they cannot see what God is doing today because yesterday kills today the good old memories of yesterday. It makes you blind for the possibilities God opens up. It blinds you for new growth and the spark of life. I told a story this morning in the service. My very first congregation where I did my practicum as an interim pastor was quite, quite a thing. When I moved in there, <clears throat> it was a blue church with blue windows, a blue carpet and blue people. Everything and I was very blue. It was so dark. It was, a, it was quite a thing. And then luckily after a year, we were moved to another church. Beautiful. And it was fantastic. It was heaven on earth. We were exactly 17 members. But when those 17 opened their, their mouths to sing, the whole world could hear them. And they worked very hard. In a year, we doubled, and in another year, we doubled again, and the congregation grew, and it was fantastic, and then I was called to another congregation. It was a good congregation. My third congregation was good. It was fantastic. It was big. The, the church was packed every Sunday, but I was unhappy because yesterday, I couldn't adapt to this new church with all the possibilities God has given us because I was stuck in the previous congregation, I couldn't move on. And so this is the same I had to get rid of yesterday. I had to deal with the good things of yesterday. And maybe you have the same thing. Maybe there's something in it for you as well. You cannot move on. You are so unhappy today. You are so stuck in yesterday that today is just so bad. Let's move on to Joseph. His yesterdays were not only days of, of beautiful things, days of royal gowns and times with his father. His yesterdays were also dark and bleak. His yesterdays were also filled with days, with a day where he was thrown into the pit of rejection, of just getting him out. His yesterday was also filled with rejection. Rejected by his brothers, ditched in a pit. Can you imagine 17 years old? And then thrown out. You don't fit anymore. You're the odd one out. You're not part of us. Standing outside the circle. Rejected. Maybe you know what rejection is. Maybe you know what it is to not fit in. And sometimes those feelings of not fitting in are so powerful that it follows us for the rest of our lives. It's like a cloud. It's like, it's like a ghost following us. Rejected. Not fitting in because of your race because of your gender, because you're too old, too young, too fat, too skinny, too poor, because of your sexuality, because of who you are, because you just, just didn't fit in. Do you know what re rejection is? Do you know it well? And Jesus knew it. He knew what it was 
to be rejected and despised by men. Yes, rejection sits in you like a cancer of the soul and it can last a lifetime. But moreover, he was filled, his just yesterday was filled with ejection. Remember Potiphar's house? He had it all. He was respected. <clears throat> After being ditched in a pit, he was sold as a slave and he ended up in Potiphar's house. And yes, there, again, he gained respect, responsibility, dignity, an environment of acceptance and love. And then he lost it all. He lost it all. Maybe you've been there. You know what it is? When they were streamlining the company and they told you, we don't need you anymore. Maybe a mistake, a mishap, and you were ousted, eject, and losing everything, respect, dignity, responsibility, the feeling of you're not needed anymore, thank you. It's just like a wound, never to be healed. Do you know that? Failures of the past, which haunt you like ghosts, maybe unresolved issues, maybe sins of the past. When you're alone, you're busy, you forget about it, but when you're alone, you lay down your head, it starts ripping your heart and your mind apart, dragging you down. So what do we do? We try to drown it by drinking way too much, and then we find out our problems. Our yesterday is a champion swimmer. He's there after you drowned him. You try to bury it just to realize that your yesterdays are like zombies. They hard to kill. You ignore it just to find out your yesterdays are like mosquitoes at night. It wakes you up. And then you try to reflect. And then you lash out with anger. Your cruel remarks, your insecurities, your manipulation. And then you try to you just internalize it. And then you feel the obsessions, the self-destructions. So Joseph, how do you deal with yesterday. Well, look at Joseph here. God gave him a Manasseh. At a point in his life, when God gave him this beautiful young boy, the son, he named him Manasseh. And that Manasseh, which means to forget, to cut off, to no debt anymore, Every time he held the son in his hands, he was reminded of how to deal with yesterday. How did he? He knew that God had to help him. He knew that God had to give him a today to deal with yesterday. And what did he do? He grabbed on this today. He held fast on this today. And every time he mentioned the name of his son, he's reminded of yesterday is gone. The good and the bad, it's gone. Yesterday is in God's hands. And you have to reach out. You have to touch. You have to embrace your Manasseh, your today. There's no other way. For the Hebrews, forgetting did not mean to put something somewhere where it fades from your conscious. It means to push it, to, to take it, and to deal with it. And consciously to say, I no debt anymore. No debt anymore. You don't owe me anything. I don't owe you anything I want to turn my back 
on this that is holding me so fast and I want to embrace today. And then, which is so beautiful, God gave him tomorrow in Ephraim. Today in Manasseh, and embrace Manasseh. And once you embrace Manasseh, you can reach out for tomorrow. You can reach out for Ephraim. And this is Joseph's story. Oh, his, his yesterday could be so like the Beatles yesterday, yesterday. All my troubles seem so far away. But for him it became a reality. Because Manasseh was there. Because Ephraim was there. I want to close on. You see, yesterday should never be allowed to be so alive that it kills today. There's a story of a man. <clears throat> As a child, he had a disability. He had polio. And because of polio, he was crippled. And he tells a story how he was very shy. He didn't like to be around people, and as a child, kids can be very cruel. He didn't want to be around uh, his, his mates. And so, on top of everything, they moved to a new town. And he, he talks about watching the, uh, uh, through the window for his friends or friends outside playing. And then he said... One day there was a knock on the door, and he opened the door just a little bit and said, yes. And they said, come and play. And he said, I can't. I'm crippled. They said, it doesn't mind. Come and play. Come out of that little box of yours. He said, when he was grown up, exactly what they were going to play, why we're going to play, what we're going to get from playing was not important to us. We just went out and played. He says, I miss being able to do that. You see, brothers and sisters, yesterday can be the cage that keeps you locked up in yesterday, whether it be good or bad. And there today is a knock on your door. Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. Do you hear my voice? And you open the door. I'll come in and we will have a ball. So today there's a knock on your door. And your door of yesterday. If you open the door, it's Jesus. And he shouts, come out and play. Amen.